Welcome to Best Decision Ever, where we believe that life comes down to a series of moments and decisions. So on this show, we take the time to highlight the very people that have had the courage to overcome fear and make the decision to start that business, make that career change, or just stand up for what they believe in. But on this show, we know that success is only one part of the story. So we dive into the challenges that these people have had to endure to get to their current point of success in hopes that we can learn their habits and mindsets and apply those to our own lives. For those of you who are new, my name is John and I'm your host. I think myself as a performance enthusiast. I love sitting down with people who are at the top of their game so I can learn from them and take those lessons and become great myself. Today, we have a very special guest. She started her career in marketing at Cliff Bar, but quickly found that that wasn't her passion. So from there, she went on a hunt to find a new career and she was told by a guidance counselor looking to recruiting. She then took the time to cold call during her lunch breaks to break into the industry. And after years of hard work, she ended up as a principal at Riviera Partners, where she recruited for top startups like Twitter and Uber. But she didn't stop there. Now she's the head of talent at Coastal Ventures, where they've invested in some companies you might know of, like Stripe and Instacart. Without further ado, Kelly Kennard. How are you today, Kelly? Hi, John. I'm well. Thanks so much for having me. Of course, of course. So appreciate having you on the show. Um, With that said, to start, what is it exactly, for the viewers watching, what is it exactly that you do and why is it so important for companies and just firms at large to get recruiting right? Sure. So I work for Coastal Ventures, which is a top venture capital fund. We have 16 billion assets under management. And currently today we have about 380 active portfolio companies that we've invested in. So myself and my team advises the companies that we invest on, on things related to hiring and uh, recruiting. And as you can imagine with any growing company, if you're growing, then you're hiring. And so it's something that we see across the board at all of our companies in various stages whether it's a three-person startup that is just beginning working out of you know someone's guest room to a company that is 200 million dollars in revenue and getting ready to ipo but there's just always a massive need in technology and in silicon valley to be hiring and it's a, it's a real challenge for these companies at these various stages so we try to help them by giving them advice and resources and uh, help them with all the challenges they have so they can grow grow and scale and get as large and as successful as they want to become. Absolutely, and I think about that too is what's going to be so valuable about this conversation we have today is a lot of the, a lot of the people that, that are watching, you know, they're, they're probably considering a career change or looking into, you know, how, how, how do I make myself um, how, do I, how do I make myself more more relevant and is just more more available for the opportunities that I want? I think a lot of people struggle to really find their place and find their passion in the career that they really, really want. Do you mind talking a little bit? I love the listening just through other interviews about your story of like finding recruiting and like making those cold calls and getting in. And with that in mind, do you mind telling us a little bit about your about your story, just getting into re- recruiting itself? Sure. Well, I was feeling really lost um, very early in my career. I worked in the sports marketing industry for Mm -hmm. Cliff Bar, the energy bar company, and then I worked for Camelback Products that makes the, the backpack hydration systems. And I, I just didn't love it. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't want to keep doing that, but I didn't know what my options were and what I would be suited for. And actually a friend recommended that I use the career counselor at the college I had gone to, because when you're an alumni, you can work with the career counseling services people for free. So I thought, well, I have nothing to lose. It's a free service. So this woman was really nice and really helpful. And she gave me a whole series of personality profile tests. And we just talked a lot about what I enjoyed, what I didn't enjoy. And based on all of the testing that she did in our conversation, she said, you should really think about recruiting as a career. And I didn't know anything at all about recruiting as a career. I had never worked with a recruiter. I didn't know any recruiters. And um, so, but I felt like, okay, I need to actually go about exploring this. How on earth do I do that? So um, it was just this process that I went through. And um, a guy that I I worked with at the time, a Camelback Products, his girlfriend was a, a technical recruiter recruiting for Silicon Valley startups. And he recommended that I chat with her and I did, and I really liked her and the firm that she worked for uh, ended up hiring me and she became uh, my boss. And she's still a really good friend of mine today. But before that happened, I went through this process of about a year where I actually, somebody recommended to me, check 
checking out this book from the library that ages me. Um, <laughs> it was called like the Kennedy book of lists. And it was this huge, big red binder Bible basically. And it listed all the recruiting firms in the country. And so I would just go sit in my car in my lunch hour because I worked in a cubicle and I didn't have privacy at work. And I would just cold call these recruiting firms, large, big, small, and anyone and everyone who would talk to me, I, I would interview with. So I did a lot of informational interviews, a lot of meeting people for coffee, just trying mm -hmm. to educate myself, understand recruiting as a business, as a function, what it means, what people liked about it, what they didn't. And some people were really nice and kind and took time out of their day to give, you know, this very young um, person with zero experience advice. So I try, try to always return that favor myself when, when young people reach out to me and they're looking for, for advice on their career and recruiting specifically. But um, through that process, I just educated myself on what recruiting is. And there's various types of recruiting. There's contingency recruiting where you basically work for free and it's a eat what you kill business. Um, that's how I, I started my career. This woman that I mentioned, the firm that she worked for was a con pure contingency agency, they call it. So they just basically threw me to the wolves. There was no database. There was no training program. Oh there was nothing. They just basically threw me to the wolves, said, here are some job requisitions, um, some open positions to work on and go at it. And if you weren't successful, you didn't make any money. It was purely commission based. So it was really, really hard and it was really tough and challenging. And I also was coming um, from an industry completely unrelated to technology. So I didn't even know technology. And then all of a sudden I was recruiting uh, software engineers who are obviously incredibly technical and trying to figure out how to screen them and how to uh, interview them. So it was really hard, but I fell in love with it as a function. I also made a lot more money in my first year of recruiting than I had ever made before in the sports marketing industry. And so that was also something that was really appealing to me because living in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's just so expensive. You you have to make a certain amount of money to just live here and survive. So I also saw this is a very lucrative career. Um, and if I work in, in, in live in Silicon Valley, I'll probably always have a job. That was my thought process at the time. So I thought to myself, I should just go work in technology and be a technology recruiter. And here I am today, all these years later, still doing it. Wow. Um, what I appreciate most was just like the courage to, even as we say in the introduction of the show, the courage to actually go and, and like make that jump and like make the cold calls, learn, like be okay with feeling uncertain about like where you are in life and just making that like walk across the like bridge of the like bridge of change, let's call it. Like what, if I may, like if I may ask, like where was your, I don't want to say headspace, but let's say headspace or mindset, like what was your mindset during that process? I think a lot of people are, are, are like on the other edge, on the, on the other side of making that type of decision. We're like, hey, I don't really like what I'm doing, but it's kind of just good enough. But like, I don't like quite know what the straight, like clear path is. Like, how did you work through that mentally, especially at a, at a, at a younger age? It was hard, but I knew part of it was motivated, honestly, by money and supporting myself because the sports marketing industry is a great industry, but it just doesn't pay that well. And so I also was just looking around and thinking, if I want to live in the Bay Area for the rest of my life, uh, this is going to be a very tough place in order to make that happen. I saw what my boss, what my boss's boss were making at the time, and it's it's just a different industry. Just it's people join that industry for different reasons. Um, so it was very hard, but I felt like I owe it to myself to just go explore this. And the more I learned about recruiting mm -hmm. as a career, the more appealing it was, but it was, it was hard to take the leap, but you know, I felt like I have nothing to lose because it wasn't like I was making a lot of money where I was and I didn't like the boss that I worked for and didn't like the job that I had. So I felt like you know, is something this sounds better and the grass could be greener on this other side. And, and, and luckily it was, but it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it sounds like it. And yeah, the, um, the motivation, especially here in the Bay area to make a little bit of money to live well, is definitely, is definitely a good motivator. Uh, what, what advice would you, would you give to someone that, that, that is thinking about changing jobs, but they're really uncertain. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe they're married, maybe, maybe they have a kid, maybe they don't, but like, what, what would you say to someone that's, that's thinking through something like that, making a, a, a career change? Cause that's a big move. I've seen actually both my siblings have done that. So I've seen it. It's kind of hard. What, yeah. What advice would you, what would you give them? 
Uh, I would say tell everybody in your network because it, the more people that know what you are Good. looking for and what you want to do, the better your chances are of finding that. Um, you know, people, I think, sometimes think when they go about looking for a new job that they can, frankly, just take sort of a lazy route and, you know, look for jobs online. And very rarely do people actually statistically find jobs that way. Most people find new jobs, new opportunities through their network. And so if you tell everybody and your friends, your family, you never know when one of those people three weeks or a month or a week later will hear or think of something and say, oh, you know what, John actually mentioned he was looking to do something like that, or I know somebody that I should have John talk to. And I think I think people are also pretty kind and, and, uh, and will make themselves available if you go to people and just say, hey, I'd like to just pick your brain and get your advice. I always try to make time when people come to me for that and just want to to talk things through. I mean, you only have so much so much time and you have to sort of set set boundaries around it. I mean, I get pinged, um, you know, 20 times a day, every day by people that I don't know who are looking for career advice and looking for new jobs. But I have to set some boundaries around it just because of bandwidth. But, you know, I will always make time for somebody in my network who's a friend or a family friend or, or somebody that I know. So um, I think just ask people for help, ask people for advice and vocalize mm -hmm. it. And I think also there's something that happens when you start verbalizing it and you start telling people, yeah. you sort of put that energy out into the world, then things have a way of shifting and things have a way of sort of finding you and you make yourself more open and available to finding those opportunities and those opportunities finding you. Okay. I, I, I love that too. Just making yourself like vocalizing some ways we can go with this, like vocalizing what you want, be willing to change and to, and to, and to change just to change this. Not, uh, yeah. Maybe who you are and your skill set in order to get what you want. I've, I, I've seen you Frankly, or at least from what it looks like on the outside, like even just looking at your LinkedIn or reading, reading through some of the other like articles and interviews, you've made a lot of transitions, right? Like you've transitioned from marketing into just like re recruiting on a on a contingency basis. You know, you worked your way up at Riviera Partners. You know, then you found yourself at Oracle. Like, can you talk about a little bit like what what it's been like to? I'd imagine there's a lot of change that has to go on like within and just skill set wise as you transition from each milestone. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Like, what were some most significant changes you had to make, whether it's going from like Riviera to Oracle, and then like how did you deal with that internally, as far as like a um, maybe like with your with your skill sets? Sure. Well, I think they are always, you know, if you had told me 10 years ago or five years ago or 15 years ago what I'd be doing today, there's no way I could have ever possibly imagined that. But then there did become this point in my career when I was recruiting. Um, I think whenever I was at a retained search firm called SBMB early in my career, recruiting very senior technology executives, I loved that. I loved working at the senior level. It's, it's retained search, so you're paid in a very different way. You're paid as a consultant up front to do the work and you're really working with, with CEOs and board members on these very sort of high profile positions for these very interesting companies. So I love that. That felt really good. But I, you know, was there five years and felt like I hit a ceiling in terms of I learned everything I could sort of learn in that role at that firm and from my colleagues and was ready to stretch myself and push myself. And I've just never been afraid to push myself out of my comfort zone professionally. And I think that's been a theme. And so I began to get restless. And then I interviewed with a bunch of other retained search firms. Riviera was a competitor to SPMB, and they just offered me the best opportunity at the time um, to start leading my own searches, which I wanted to do myself and see if I could do it. And I also liked the team and, and the people and the culture that they were offering. So I wasn't afraid to jump in, but it was hard. It, you know, it was hard all of a sudden to go into leading these projects by yourself and you're, you're, you're on the line. And if they don't go well, it's a pretty scary place to be in. Um, and then I kept getting uh, a call about this role at Oracle. And whenever um, Oracle first called about this, this opportunity, I thought to myself, you know, no, that's not what I want to do next. If I were to go in-house and go recruit internally for a company, I would go somewhere like Twitter or Facebook. Um, you know, Oracle's a great company, but it's been around a really long time. But they were very, very persistent. And the opportunity was also appealing because it was to work directly for the president, Thomas Curian, who ran all of technology and reported directly to Larry Ellison. So when they told me more about the role, I thought, well, that's actually kind of interesting. 
amazing. Um, he's now the CEO of Google Cloud and a, and a phenomenal man. And we're still in, we're still in touch today and so awesome. I get Christmas cards from him and we keep in touch and he's he's amazing. And so I thought to myself, you know, that's an interesting role that would round out my background professionally. And I bet he's somebody I could learn a lot from because he's, you know, he's very well known in the industry. So uh, and when I went to meet with him, we just absolutely hit it off. And I walked out of his office saying, I'm going to go work for Thomas Curry and as long as, as he'll have me. And I knew I would learn a lot. And I learned a tremendous amount from Thomas and from that experience. But again, it you know, pushed me outside my, my comfort zone. But then I knew I wouldn't be an Oracle sort of lifer, if you will. I knew that I would enjoy working at Oracle for a period of time, but there would become a day where the company, the, the bureaucracy, the hierarchy, the size of the company would start to feel uh, frustrating to me. And that, that day came about three, three and a half years in. So I had been telling my network, you know, back to my earlier point about vocalize your network, what you want to do next. I told my peers in the industry, when I leave Oracle, it will be to go to a venture capital fund and run talent. That's what I want to do next. So I was you know, selectively taking calls when those opportunities would come my way and had some conversations and interviews over, over a couple year period while I was at Oracle. And it just so happened that when I was restless, the opportunity um, at Battery Ventures presented itself. And, um, you know, ironically, again, because I had been telling my network, I was in this incredible position where I interviewed with three or four different venture firms at the same time for the basically the same, you know, head of talent role. So I was in this incredible, op- incredible place where I was able to compare the different funds and the different roles and the way they were scoping the role amongst one another. And then Battery was just very clear to me, the right opportunity for me. And I liked the team, um, but it was a long process. It was a nine month interview process, which was really long and exhausting. Nine months? Nine months, yeah. We, it was a nine month process. It was long, a very long time. So that was hard. But, you know, when I got that job, I felt like, you know, this is my dream job. This is what I've been, you know, thinking about doing. Because when I was, you know, going back to SBNB or Riviera Partners, I worked with the people that are in the role that I have today, these talent partners at these internal venture capital funds. And I saw what they did and I got to know them and their job was always really in- interesting and exciting to me. So it was exciting for me personally, whenever I sort of landed that job back in 2017. I'm just trying to put my head around a nine month interview process. Mm-hmm. Like usually I think it's like three weeks or four weeks, but <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, my, my, oh. My, my, my process with Coastal Ventures was nine months as well. We talked for nine months. It was a nine month process. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think when you get to the top, it takes longer. Um, interesting. So let's let's talk about this a little bit because I, I have, you've you've mentioned this a couple of times. I think it's something that has probably been one of the keys to gotten to to have gotten you where you are today. But it's something that a lot of people have a hard time with, which is getting outside of your comfort zone. Like yes. how like what do you, I how do you do it? What do you tell yourself? Do you have like a like like a little ritual you do before you get out of your comfort zone. Like, what do you do? Like, ser- I'm serious because uh, so many people struggle. I mean, I struggle with this at times too, right? And sure. I'm someone that like my identity is wrapped around like I'm okay with being uncomfortable, but I still get a so hard time. Like, how do you how do you deal with it? That's a really good question. I think I just don't want to have regrets, um, yeah. especially. And so there are times when I when I we all get to those places. And I think a lot of people. Uh, struggle with this. I see this with friends, see this with family, see this with colleagues where they're really comfortable in their job. They're maybe not happy, but they're really comfortable. We, you can get to that place in your job where you come in, you know what to do. People know you, you have credibility, you know, it's expected of you. You can come in, you can do your job, even if you don't love it, even there's days when you hate it, but you, but it's safe. And I, one of my pet peeves has always been every single place I've ever worked. There's always been people when you get to that job, you know, you meet everybody and there's always the people that are kind of unhappy and miserable and always complaining and venting about the company, the culture, the compensate, whatever it is. And many of those people are still working at those companies today, long after I have left and moved on. And I just never wanted to be one of those people that wasn't that happy and would always be that person that would vent and complain and sort of uh, talk about like what was wrong, but not do anything about it. And there's been so many times whenever I've interacted with colleagues like that. And I want to say, if you're unhappy here, leave, there's lots of other places to go work. This is Silicon Valley. You can go 
do a lot of other things if you just don't like it here. But, you know, I, those people, many of them that come to mind are still at those places, still probably unhappy. And I just never have sort of allowed myself to be that way. So sort of when I get to a place uh, at my job uh, and within my career where I feel like this isn't feeling that feeling that good anymore for, for, you know, various reasons, it could be the challenge, it could be the culture, it could be any number of things. I just feel I sort of just have a conversation with myself thinking you need to push yourself you need to challenge yourself and you need to not be afraid to go out and go do something else, um, even if you fail, because just being stagnant and unhappy or let alone miserable is much, much worse for you and for everyone else. And it's just not fair. It's not fair to anyone, especially yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's well said too. It's just like you don't want to at least that that resonated with me at least. You don't want to have the regret, you know. Like you don't you don't want to sit there and be miserable. Um, how do you deal with failure? Right, it's such like a that's such a hard thing. How do you deal? I'm assuming at some point everyone fails, right? How how, how do you deal with failure? And is there a time that's stuck out to you that that you can recall? Uh, if not, totally okay. Because I'm putting that spot, but I, I'm I'm curious. Uh, failure is hard. It's very difficult for me personally, because I'm a true perfectionist. So I put a lot of pride um, on myself in, in sort of not failing. So when when it when it happens, it's very, it's very difficult for me, because I just I not that not that you don't fail. I mean, you can try and you can do things and everyone has 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 failures, but it is, it is hard. It's something that I, I beat myself up over and I have a probably too much at times. Um, there's, we all make mistakes. We all have things that sort of don't go our way, but it's, um, it's not something that's easy for me. And I'm not somebody that can just shrug it off by any means. Yeah. yeah. That makes two of us. That makes two of us. <laughs> um, with that in mind, changing gears a little bit, what was it like to work for Thomas Curry? And, and people like that, like, I think there's, there's like, there's when, when, when you, when people work with someone like that, like it kind of changes your frame of reference of like what's possible. And like, you know, I just like how, how you think, what was that like for you? And like, what were some of the key lessons you learned from Thomas working, yeah, just working with him? Yeah, he is amazing at uh, you. One thing I would always tell my candidates when I would prep them before they'd interview with him is you will get more content, more information, more direction, and more strategy uh, out of him in a 10-minute conversation than you will in an hour with most people. He is an incredible communicator and has this ability to be an incredibly succinct and crisp and clear communicator. And there is no long, meandering, wandering, you know, long-winded answers with Thomas. You know, he would call me sometimes on a Sunday afternoon. I'd be like literally in the grocery store or something. And I'd be like, oh my God, it's Thomas calling. And then we would just, he want to talk about something. So we'd have this conversation, but even if it was five minutes or 10 minutes, you walked away going, okay, I know exactly what he's calling about. What's up, what he wants me to do, what my action plan is starting tomorrow. Um, so I think that's something I've, I've learned from him. And I think I try to be a crisp and clear communicator after, after interfacing with him. Um, he's also just not afraid to, to set boundaries. There was times when he would set meetings and he would, uh, only schedule them for 10 minutes and you'd get this, you know, request from his assistant, like Thomas wants to meet with you for 10 minutes about X, Y, Z. And so there's none of this sort of chit chat or like, Hey, what's everybody up to this weekend? What are you doing for Easter? And, and you get into the meeting and it is all, everyone brings their a game and you just hammer it out. And he doesn't, he doesn't need to schedule a 20 minute meeting to have fluffy chit chat if he can get through the content in 10 minutes. And so that's something that I've, I've learned from him as well. Um, He's very conscious of how he manages and schedules his time. Um, I think that's something that I've also observed and also sort of taken from him is how to be very protective of your time and how to really think about where and how and who to spend your time on. I mean, he has to be given his job and given the demands on him, you know, at Oracle and even now at Google Cloud. Um, I think, yeah, there's just so much that I learned from him. He was an incredible, incredible leader, an incredible person to work with. And, and um, I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to do so. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like the key lessons there are like, be really good with your time and just know like why you're doing something. It, if I had to simplify it really, uh, but no, that's, 
that's that's awesome. And like, how how important is it? You mentioned like just surrounding yourself with like being conscious of who you surround yourself with and what you do in your own career. Like, how important has it been to surround yourself with um, like high performing people or like A players or things like that? I think like you're talking to other other guests on the show, they're really conscious of like the support systems they have around them, the people they have around them. What role has that played in your career and your overall success? Oh, uh, it's something I think about a lot. And I think a lot of us also have, have given even more thought to who we, who and what and where we spend our time after and during the pandemic. Um, so it's something that I'm more and more conscious about, even in my personal life, you know, with, uh, with friends and, um, when opportunities come up and, you know, one came up recently where it was, oh, this, this couple wants to do a double date with you guys. And I'm not that excited about that idea. And so I thought to myself, you know, I just don't, they're nice people, but I don't know that I'm going to, I'm actually going to carve out and make time to go do that on Saturday night. I would rather spend time with these people over here. So it's something that I think is uh, important because, you know, who you surround yourself with really says a lot about, about who you are, your friends, your, uh, you know, mm-hmm. our families are our families, but your colleagues. And I think I always have really enjoyed working with really smart uh, people, people that are, that I admire, that I look up to, and that I feel like I can learn a lot from and, and I respect. So that's something that I've always gravitated towards. There's always been, there's been times earlier in my career where I would sort of lose, lose, lose trust or confidence in a boss or, or colleagues. And then think to myself, you know, this this, I just can't, I can't keep working for this person or can't keep working with this team anymore. I just, it doesn't feel like the right thing to me. So I think it's something that's important and it's something that I definitely try to focus on. I think, yeah, I think just be protective of your time. Absolutely. Uh, One of the things that I'm curious about is how do you deal with just, just challenges overall? Like what habits do you have to keep you consistent um, you can kind of take us wherever you'd like, but I'm just curious, like, what keeps you consistent? What keeps you consistent through the challenges? Like, I'm sure that in your in your long career, there've been some really hard times, been some really good times. Like, how do you stay consistent through, through throughout it all? Hmm. I used to have a boss at Riviera that would say, "You go from hero to zero throughout the day," and that is so true. As I think, especially in recruiting, you'd go into a conference call with a client, you'd be all excited. You have this pipeline of candidates that you were really excited to talk about, and you think your your candidates are so strong and so great, and you're excited to present them. And then you'd be on the phone with the CEO, or maybe some board members are there, and they would just shoot them down for various reasons. They'd be like, "Oh, I know that person, and you know he didn't perform well at X Y Z." company. So, you know, I know he's out and you, you know, you get off the call and you look at each other and be like, God, we just went from hero to zero. And so I think I've learned to just somewhat sort of like laugh about it at times. And, Hmm. you know, there was just last night, I was having a conversation with my fiance about work and about, you know, something that's, that's challenging at work right now. And, um, I even use that quote. I'm like, yeah, you know, I went from like hero at the beginning of the day, having this person interview thinking it was going to go really well. And then three hours later, I found out it didn't go well. So I'm, I'm taken down. And so I think you have to just realize they're going to be those, those highs and those lows. So you have to sort of be willing to just ride them out and try to develop a sense of humor about it. Um, also just for me personally, exercise is key. I am yes, I am so with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. It, 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 yes, mentally, emotionally, physically keeps me so much uh stronger. And I can sort of weather those those highs and those lows better. And there's been, you know, times even recently where I'm having a really hard or rough day, and I think to myself, you know what? I'm going to go take my dog on a 20 minute walk or 30 minute walk around the block, get outside, get some fresh air, let my dog sniff around, get some different perspective and then come back and try to just reset. But um, I think exercise and being willing, not afraid to sort of take a break when you know you need to take a break and be aware of what's what you need for yourself. You know, it's better Mm -hmm. to take a break and reset than maybe like, I don't know, get get edgy or be, be overly frustrated or have that come across through people with people you work with. Yeah. Um, that I definitely resonate too, which is like learning to, well, one, the working out for sure, for sure. But then two, like the learning to kind of like laugh off things and not like see like the bigger picture, see the bigger picture in life. Like it's not that serious and seems serious in the moment, but it's not that right. serious. Um, okay. So looking back, I'm curious, what, what would you say in your career is just been your best decision 
ever. And uh, you, you've, again, you've been in a lot of places, you've seen a lot of things. What would you say has been your best decision? I think going into recruiting, honestly, making the jump to become a recruiter and not being afraid to go for it because it is a career, you know, all these years later, it is a career that I'm, I feel like I'm professionally very well suited for and that I truly enjoy. Certainly there are days that I don't enjoy it. Certainly there are times and there's aspects of it that I like more than others, but it has been something that I think sort of capitalizes on the strengths in my personality and, uh, and it's been one that I've really leaned into and really embraced and, and truly, truly enjoyed. And then it's, I feel lucky that I'm now at this place where I get to do something that I love, get to work with all these really interesting and exciting companies and work at this sort of pivotal moment in Silicon Valley. Um, I think it's a really exciting time to be in technology and it's exciting to, to get to play, you know, a, a small piece in that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'm curious for you is now like kind of like moving and switching gears, like just for fun or interest, like what are you most interested in? How do you use your time outside of work? Uh, like maybe I like, one question I like to ask is if you had a gift or book or two, what, what would you give? Or it's like, how do you spend your time outside of work? Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, exercise is, is really important. Um, and now I spend a lot of time skiing, hiking, mountain biking, road biking, trail running. Um, so I spend a lot of my time in my weekends outside, you know, this coming weekend, I have days planned Saturday and Sunday to be outside biking with friends and with friends. I think for me, uh, you know, I have an amazing fiance. So I spend a lot of my time with him. We have an incredible dog that we adore. Uh, and with friends, you know, my friends really fill me up. They, they fill up my, my cup, so to, so to speak. So I definitely make a lot of time for, for my friends and, uh, I'm very social. And, and I think that just goes along with my recruiter personality that I'm, you know, I'm a connector and I, I'm an extrovert. I thrive on being out and about and with people and seeing friends. And I put a lot of energy into my friendships. And that's something that, um, I get a lot back from as well. They're they're I'm really lucky to have great people in my life. Okay. I, ad I admire that. Was there, have you always been like that? Like, is that something that you were very, became more conscious of over time of like investing in your friend group or that's just been the way that Kelly it's always been that way. I mean, my mom oh, so loves awesome. to tell okay. a story that like when I was a little kid, I'd come home from elementary school and she'd be like, how was your day? I'd be like, mom, I made a new friend today. And her name is, you know, Abigail, and blah, 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 blah. So I've always just been an extrovert. I've always been somebody that's a connector. I've always uh, had a lot of friends, wanted to spend time with friends. I've just, I, I, I thrive on, on being around and talking to and being with people, you know, that's, that's, yeah. it's really what sort of gets me out of bed in the morning personally and professionally. Yeah. I, 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 I admire you for that. Cause it's so easy just to focus on my career and just like, Oh, I want to be like successful, but then you forget like the family and the friendship and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so thank you for that. That, that. That's awesome. Before we ask the final question, where can people find you? Uh, on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn um, at Kelly Kennard and I'm on Twitter. Just, I think it's at Kelly Kennard. Um, I'm on the Coastal Ventures website. I mean, yeah, social media. Okay. And by the way, you have, you have lots of great content, right? Cause you oh, saw because you've written stuff. I think I was actually very impressed. So I'm shouting that out right now. Um, okay. Final question. What advice would you give someone on the other side of a big decision? Uh, again, maybe they want to start a company more, more, more relevantly. Maybe they want to make a, make a career change and they're really struggling. Um, what advice would you give them? Yeah. Well, it would depend on, I think, the situation to be to be a little bit more specific, but um, don't be afraid to take a risk and trust your gut. I've always made my big decisions in life by using my gut. I'm a very much a gut driven uh, decision maker. And uh, they're just, I think, always comes this, this time in everyone's lives with various things, whether it's personally or professionally, where you're at this crossroads and you need to make a decision. And uh, I think leaning in and trusting your gut and trusting your intuition. And I think we all have this intuition if we sort of allow ourselves to be open to it. And I think we'll be guided in the right decision. You just have to be not afraid to sort of trust it and lean into it and, and dig into it. Even though it can be really hard, there's been times when leaning in and making that decision has meant, has, has had large ramifications. Uh, some of which have been, you know, challenging or, or even painful, but at the end of the day, you know, you come out on the other side, um, 
knowing you trusted your gut and you made, you made the right call. And so just try not to be afraid, I think is, is what I would tell people. Try not to be afraid, trust your gut. Actually, that sounds like wisdom. 